So with me now, Alan Pullinger, the CEO of the First Rand Group. Uh, again, nobody can fault your performance. You're almost back at pre-COVID-19 levels. Are we firmly past the worst of it, Alan? Yeah, hi, Bronwyn, and to all of your listeners. I guess we are, I mean, we talk about the fact that you know, the, the results are up strongly. So, the, you know, there's all these big percentages that we throw around. So period on period up 40, 43%. And it, it sounds super impressive, but the reality is it's, it's off a low base um, or, you know, a base that hasn't fully normalized. Um, clearly that story is, um, and I think we're at the tail end of that. Um, and it, it's largely going to be done, I think, when we get to our year end in, in June. So this is kind of the half, half year results. Uh, you know, we've probably got a little bit more of it, um, but but obviously in the new financial year, which starts in July of this year, we will then need to, of course, grow off the base that we have now just but you But you have said, a, Alan, you have said in your verbiage that you're expecting a better second half. So it is almost as though all systems are go, correct? Yeah, yeah. So there's no doubt. I mean, I think corporate South Africa, certainly for first round, we are normalizing. Um, and it's, you know, we're getting towards the tail end of that. Of course, we still have the issue of, of balance sheet provisions, and we still have, you know, very large, chunky provisions. I guess clearly we're not going to need all of those provisions. And so, you know, on, on a sort of a, you know, very sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, informed, data driven, you know, linking to the macroeconomic environment, some of those provisions will recycle back into earnings. So that is a story that still does need to unfold in the reporting period ahead. But, but there's no doubt, I think from our business as usual, uh, customer engagement, lending deposits, I mean, I think we are, we, we are kind of getting out, as you say, sort of really out of the pandemic. I'm not talking about the health side of it, I mean, you know, obviously there's a, a fifth wave and a sixth wave, and I don't know how these things play exactly. out. Exactly, and I was chatting to Adrian Gore last week, and it's definitely something that I think we're learning to live alongside, hoping that the next waves will be more muted in, in their impact. Yeah. That aside, I do want to just focus on, a, on your, your focus on better quality, low-risk clients that have been almost a defensive strategy for the first round group. And, and that has held you strong. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose what we did is, you know, through the pandemic, you know, different people managed to, you know, get through it. Uh, you know, some people had incomes that, that weren't really affected. Some people's incomes were catastrophically uh, impacted. You know, we've seen it across sectors as well. Some sectors are still very challenged. Some sectors actually have fully bounced back. Some sectors boomed during the pandemic. So I suppose all of that tells you one needs to be very discerning around lending because it isn't just, you know, listen, we're back as, as usual. One has to, I think, you know, choose carefully. And what we, what we are trying to do is sort of time our origination back to the full recovery of what's happening in, in South Africa in terms of consumers, their own balance sheets, their income levels. You know, it isn't really a sort of a flick a switch and everyone's back to, you know, boom times and they can all lend. So I think one, one takes a, you know, a very sort of considered approach. What we don't want to do is, is push credit, you know, uh, now onto consumers who, you know, really are probably not fully recovered we have got interest rates that are probably headed upwards. We've got some pressures on disposable income. You know, the, the, you know, the pump prices are pretty expensive at the moment. We're all feeling that. The consequences of that still have to flow into the economy, into inflation. So I think this is a time, you know, look after your customers, make sure we're meeting their credit needs, but we're not, we're not in a mindset of let's go and push credit. Especially with the geopolitical risks in the world right now, the, the Russia-Ukraine overhang, do you see this as a, an enormous risk to global stability? Is it something that you are talking about around the boardroom table? Yeah, um, it's, 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 it's clearly a major sort of global event. Um, you know, it's, it's fluid. So, you know, I haven't got any particular insight on how this unfolds. Of course, there's a, a nightmare scenario where the, the escalation 
takes on a new level and you know NATO countries get involved and and you have a, a major regional war taking place. I suppose that's not impossible. I, I would like to believe it's unlikely, but I don't know. Um, clearly, if that does happen, I think there is a risk that global growth, which was already starting to slow, may well go into recession. So, I, I mean, I think that is, that's a possibility. Um, we don't think it's likely, but let's hope and pray that doesn't happen. If it stays quite contained, so it's a UK, uh, sorry, a Ukraine story, which is, uh, listen, a terrible disaster for Ukraine, um, you know, indefensible on every level. But if it does stay contained at that, you know, you, you then really have, you know, a, a, a heavily sanctioned Russia, um, which is still going to have an impact on, on global markets. Um, so there are a couple of sort of areas that we're watching very closely, of course, commodity prices. So we've already seen, you know, and, well, and I suppose for South Africa, it's a, it's a mixed bag. You know, on the one hand, you know, you and I are paying much more for petrol. Uh, as a consequence of the oil price, so that's not good. So that's a, that's painful. I suppose on the other hand, as as a country, we may ironically be a beneficiary of some of the commodity prices. Um, and get another windfall on the tax side. Yeah, absolutely. And so you know, again, not of our doing, uh, but we but we're there to benefit. So you know, then we're going to have to watch what central banks do. You know, central banks were of the mindset they were going to withdraw liquidity from markets, they were going to start hiking interest rates. I mean, the Fed was looking going to do potentially five interest rate hikes. Yeah, and, and there was a debate that the first one might be 50 basis points. I mean, you heard all those conversations. Now, do we think the direction of travel is the same? Yes, we do. But we think it's going to now be slower. You know, they, they're going to have to be, I think, a bit more considered as to how they do it. So that, that but again, it's an assumption. Um, you know what you know really what happens to inflation and then there's sort of second order effects and third order effects so for example you know one of the things we are doing in the group is we are on we are on heightened alert for cyber risk um, you know so both here and in our UK business you know and again because it's likely and we've really seen a pickup uh, in some of the malicious attacks and stuff so there's no doubt that we're moving into that environment as well so there's, there's lots of different impacts for us. Um, so Leading through the South current Africa. thing, I mean, could you have thought, of, you know, COVID-19, a potential global uh, war, this is, must, you know, I mean, this is a, a landscape uh, as a leader, you couldn't have had a, a more difficult playbook to, to execute on. Just coming back to the, the local environment, again, and I'm not pitting you against discovery at all, what I am, cognizant of is my conversation with Adrian last week where clearly they are very positive about their bank. They're still acquiring clients at 800 clients a day uh, and that is a phenomenal rate according to their internal metric. I mean, I think Discovery Health only signs about three, 300 to 400 clients a day. In your verbiage, FNB clearly is the largest digital bank in South Africa. You've won numerous awards on the innovation side. Can you hold your position? Discovery again, making a play for primary banking clients. Yeah. Um, all right. So you, I mean, you touch on competition. I know you've, you've spoken specifically about uh, Discovery. I, you know, I think they, you know, are, are they and other customers uh, as competitors sort of opening these bank accounts at the kind of rate that you talk about? Yes. I mean, Time Bank also spoke about a phenomenal amount of, 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 of account openings. I think what we need to do is look at the revenue per account. So, you know, there's, there are customer accounts and customer accounts. Um, so there are secondary bank accounts and, and sort of third bank accounts that, that are existing in the marketplace. And you're going to make very little money out of those. So the question is, how many of those customer accounts, uh, to your point, can you switch into main bank transactional accounts? Now, do I think discoveries is going to be successful. They have been successful. Yes, of course. Uh, I think it's a great business, great brand. Um, clearly, they've got that vitality story to, to play well uh, into that. Do I think they will take some customers from FNB? We think so. But at the same time, they're going to take from other banks. Um, so it's not just FNB. You know, is it good? Uh, you know, it, it, I think it is good. It's a different proposition. I don't think Discovery 
is playing a, a you know a cheap proposition. I think it's you know certainly cheap is not the word I would sort of associate with Discovery Bank. I think it's going to appeal uh, to a certain cohort of customers. I don't think there are propositions that we are seeing, particularly from Discovery Bank, which we think FNB hasn't got. Um, so we really think FNB has got kind of a rich sort of array of, of meaningful propositions. And we've also got eBucks. So the one thing about eBucks, you know, it's it's kind of 20 years in the making. It's probably the most successful rewards program, you know, uh, uh, in South Africa. It We have not chopped and changed it. We haven't changed the name. It's been the same model sort of for 20 years. And in terms of generosity, I mean, the, the, I mean, we're at sort of an annualized payout of about 2 billion Rand, which is enormous. I mean, there are not many businesses. You know, look how many businesses on the stock exchange actually make 2 billion Rand. I mean, that's just what we pay out in rewards. Puts uh, it into, definitely puts it into context. Alan, when we last spoke, and this is the final question, uh, FNB was your star performer. It continues to play that role within your group of companies. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and its performance, it's, you know, it's probably, you know, we, we look at on the earnings again, again, that base effect, you know, the big jump in earnings, getting customers, it's a, it's the biggest contributor to group earnings, it's the biggest contributor to the dividend. I think the, the, the aspect that really plays out, I think, in these set of results from FNB is their, is their success on the deposit gathering side. So they've done exceptionally well in, in gathering deposits. We, FNB is now the number one uh, gatherer of household deposits uh, in the country. Now, that's very important for a bank um, you know, to, 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 to get that liquidity. And where does it show? It, of course, it shows in FNB, but it, it, it materially shows in group treasury uh, in the group because all of that funding comes into group treasury and group treasury has to invest it. So, you know, what does Group Treasury do? do? You know, they don't lend, make loans to customers. They're going to go and buy government securities. So, you know, you know in essence, risk-free securities in South Africa, which are going to be government instruments. And what does that do? It drives the earnings of Group Treasury. So you, you could see in this set of results a really good performance of Group Treasury, which I guess without context, you would look at you would say, well, look how well Group Treasury is done. But the reality is it's actually a, ref a reflection of just how well FNB's done. 